Welcome back everyone. Today we will be reading chapter 3 of A Spell for Chameleon. Let's get into it. Chapter 3. Chasm. Bink stood at the brink, appalled. The path had been sundered by another trench. No, not a trench, but a mighty chasm. Half a mile across and seemingly of bottomless depth. Sherry, the centaur, could not have known known of it, or she would have warned him. So it must be a very recent formation, perhaps within the past month. Only an earthquake or cataclysmic magic could have formed such a canyon so rapidly. Since there had been no earthquakes that he knew of, it had to be magic, and that implied a magician of phenomenal power. Who could it be? The king in his heyday might have been able to fashion such a chasm by using a riggedly controlled storm, a channeled hurricane, but he had no reason to, and his powers had faded too much to manage anything like this now. Evil magician Trent had been a transformer, not an earth mover. Good magician Humphrey's magic was divided into into a great into a hundred sordid di divinatory spells. Some of those might tell him how to create such a gross channel, but it was hardly conceivable that Humphrey would bother to do it. Humphrey never did anything unless there was a fee to be, to be earned from it. Was there another great magician in Xanth? Wait. He had heard rumors of a master of illusion. It was far easier to make an apparent chasm than a genuine one. That could be an be an amplif amplification of Zink's pretend whole, whole talent. Zink was no magician, but if a real magician had this type of talent, this was the kind of effect he might create. Maybe if Bink simply walked out into the chasm, his feet would find the path con continuing on. He looked down. He saw a small cloud floating blithely along, about 500 feet down. A gust of cool, dank wind came up to brush him, brush him back. He shivered. That was extraordinarily realistic for an illusion. He shouted, Hello! He heard the echo following about five seconds after. Hello! He picked up a pebble and flipped it into the seeming, into the seeming chasm. It disappeared into the depths and no sound of its landing came back. At last, he kneeled and poked his finger into the air beyond the brim. It met no resistance. He touched the edge and found it material and vertical. He was convinced unwillingly. The chasm was real. There was nothing to do but go around it, which meant he was not within five miles of his destination, but within fifty or a hundred, depending on the extent of this amazing crevice. Should he turn back... The villagers, the villagers certainly should be advised of this manifestation. On the other hand, it might be gone by the time he brought anyone else back here to see it, and he would be labeled a fool as well as a spellless wonder. Worse, he would be called a coward who had invented a story to explain his fear of visiting the magician and gaining absolute proof of his talentlessness. What had been created magically could be abolished magically, so he had better try to get around it. Bink looked somewhat wearily at the sky. The sun was low in the west. He had an hour or so of diminishing daylight left. He'd better spend it trying to locate a house in which to spend the night. The last thing he wanted was to sleep outside in unfamiliar territory, at the mercy of strange magic. He had had a very easy trip so far, thanks to Sherry, but with this emergency detour, it would become much more difficult. Which way to turn, east or west, the chasm seemed to run in inter interminably in both directions, but the lay of the land was slightly less rugged to the east, making a gradual descent. Maybe it would approach the bottom of the chasm, enabling him to cross it. 
farmers tended to, to build in valleys rather than on mountains so as to have ready sources of water and be free of the hostile magic of high places. He would go east. But this region was sparsely settled. He had seen no human habitations along the path so far. He walked increasingly swiftly through the, through the forest. As dusk came, he saw great black shapes rising out of the chasm, vastly spreading leathery wings, cruelly bent beaks, glintening small eyes. Vultures, perhaps, or worse. He felt horribly uneasy. It was now necessary to conserve his rations, for he had no way of knowing how far they would have to stretch. He spotted a breadfruit tree and cut a loaf from it, but discovered the bread was not yet ripe. He would get indigestion eating it. He had to find a farmhouse. The trees became larger and more gnarled of trunk. They seemed menacing in the shadows. A wind was, was rising, causing the stiff, twisted branches to sigh. Nothing ominous about that. These effects weren't even magical. But Bink found his heart beating more rapidly, and he kept glancing back over his shoulder. He was no longer on the established trail, so his comparative security was gone. He was going deeper into the hinterland, where anything could happen. Night was the time of sinister magic, and there were diverse and potent kinds. The peace spell of the pines was only an example. There were surely fear spells and worse, if only he could find a, whore, a, a house. Some adventurer he was. The moment he had to go a little out of his way, the instant it got dark, he started reacting to his own too creative re imagination. The fact was... This was not the deep wilderness. There would be a few real threats to a careful man. The true wilds were beyond the good magician's castle, on the other side of the chasm. He forced himself to slow down and keep his gaze forward. Just keep walking, swinging the staff over to touch anything suspicious. No foolish... The end of the staff touched an in innocuous black rock. The, bl the rock burst up upward with a loud whirring noise. Bink scrambled back, falling on the ground, arms thrown up protectively before his face. The rock spread wings and flapped away. Whoo! <sighs> it protested reproachfully. It had been only a stone dove, folded into its rock shape for camouflage and insulation during the night. Naturally, it had reacted when poked, but it was quite harmless. If stone doves nested here, it was bound to be safe for him. All he had to do was stretch out anywhere and sleep. Why didn't he just do that? Because he was foolishly terrified of being alone at night, he answered himself. If only he had some magic, then he would feel more secure. Even a simple confidence spell would serve. He spied a light ahead. Relief! It was a yellow square, nearly certain in, uh, nearly certain indication of human habitation. He was almost tearfully pleased. He was, he was no child, no adolescent, but he might as well be. Here in the forest and off the bounds of his map, he needed the comfort of human companionship. He hurried toward the light, hoping it would not turn out to be some illusion or trap sponsored by in, in a inimical being by an inimical being it was real it was a farm at the edge of a small village now he could see other squ squares of light farther down the valley almost joyfully he knocked on the door it opened grudgingly to show a homely woman in a spoiled in a soiled apron she peered at him suspiciously i don't know you she grumped edging the door closed again I am Bink of the North Village, he said quickly. I have traveled all day and was balked by the chasm. Now I need lodging for the night. I will perform some reasonable service for the favor. I'm strong. I can chop wood or load hay or move rocks. You don't need magic to do those things, she said. Not with magic, with my hands. I. How do I know you're not a wraith, she demanded. Bink held out his left hand, wincing. Prick me. I bleed. 
it was a standard test for most nocturnal supernatural creatures. It was a standard test for most nocturnal supernatural creatures had no blood, unless they had recently fed on some living creature. Even then, they had none that would flow. Oh, come on, Martha, a man's gruff voice called from inside. There hasn't been a wraith in these parts for a decade, and they don't... They don't do no harm anyway. Let him in. If he eats, he's human. Ogres eat, she muttered, but she cracked the door open far enough for Bl for Bink to squeeze through. Now Bink saw the farm's guardian animal, a small werewolf, probably one of their children. There were no true werewolves or other wares of th that he knew of. All were humans who had developed the talent. Such changelings were increasingly frequent, it seemed. This one had the large head and flattish face typical of the type. A real werewolf would have been indistinguishable from a canine until it changed. Then it would have been a wolfish man. Bink put out his hand as it slunk up to, to sniff him, then patted it on the head. The creature metamorphized into a boy about eight years old. Did I, did I scare you, huh? He begged, terrified. Bink agreed. The lad turned toward the man. He's clean, Pa, he answered. He announced. No smell of magic on him. That's the trouble, Bink murmured. If I had magic, I wouldn't be traveling, but I meant what I said. I can do good physical work. No magic, the man inquired as the woman poured Bink a steaming bowl of stew. The farmer was in his mid-thirties, mid as homely as his wife, but possessed of a few deep smile, smile lines around his mouth and eyes. He was thin but obviously sturdy. Hard physical labor made for tough men. He flexed purple as he talked, then green, his whole body changing color smoothly, his talent. How'd you make it all the way from North Village in one day then? A lady centaur gave me a lift. A filly? I'll bet she did. Where'd you hang on where'd you hang on to when she jumped? Bink smiled ruefully. Well, she said she'd drop me in a trench if I did it again, he admitted. Ha 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 the man brayed. Farmers being relatively uneducated tended to have an earthly sense of humor. Bink noticed that the homely wife wasn't laughing, and the boy merely stared uncomprehendingly. Now the farmer got down to business. Listen, I don't need no hand labor now, now's about, but I've got a part in a hearing coming up, and I don't want to go. Upsets the missus, you know. Bink nodded, though he did not understand. He saw the wife nod grim agreement. What sort of thing was this? So if you want to work off your lodging, you can stand in for me, the farmer continued. Won't only take about an hour. No work to it except to agree to anything the bailiff says. Softest job you can find. And easy for you, too, because you're a stranger, playing opposite a cute young thing. He caught the grim look of his wife and aborted that line. How about it? Anything I can do, Banks said uncertain, uncertainly. What was this about playing opposite a cute young thing? He'd never find out. While the wife was present, would Sabrina object? Fine. There's hay in the loft and a bucket so you won't have to go outside. Just don't snore too loud. The missus don't like it. The missus didn't like a lot of things, it seemed. How did a man ever come to marry a woman like that? Would Sabrina turn shrewish after marriage? The idea made him uneasy. I won't, Bink agreed. The stew was not very tasty, but it it was filling. Good stuff to travel on. He slept comfortably in the hay, with the wolf curled up beside him. He did have, have to use the pot, and it stank all night, having no cover, but that was much better than going into the magic night. After that initial ex expression of objection to the stew, his innards settled down. Bink really had no complaint. He had gruel for breakfast, heated without fire. That was the wife's talent, 
a useful one for a farmstead. Then he reported to the neighbor's house a mile on down along the chasm for the hearing. The bailiff was a big bluff man, above whose head a small cloud formed when he concentrated on anything too intently. Know anything about it? he inquired about Bink explained. Nothing, Bink admitted. You'll have to tell me what to do. Good. It's just a sort of little play playlet. To settle a problem without ruining anybody's reputation, we call it surrogate magic. Mind you, don't use any actual magic. I won't, Bink said. You just agree to whatever I ask you, that's all. Bink began to get nervous. I don't believe in lying, sir. This ain't exactly lying, boy. It's in a good cause. You'll see. I'm surprised you folk don't practice it in North Village. Bink was uneasily silent. He hoped he had not gotten himself into something ugly. The others arrived. Two men and three young women. The men were ordinary, bearded farmers. One young, one middle-aged. The girls ranged from indifferent to ravaging. Ravishing. Bink forced his eyes away from the prettiest one lest he stare. He was the... She was the most voluptuous, striking, black-haired beauty he had ever seen. A diamond in the mud of this region. Now the six of you sit down across from each other at this table, the bailiff said in his official voice. I'll do the talking when the judge comes. Mind you, this is a play, but it's secret. When I swear you in, it's for keeps. Absolutely no blabbing about the details after you get out, understand? They all nodded. Bink was becoming more perplexed. He now understood about playing opposite a sweet young thing. But what kind of play was this? With an audience of one, that, that, one, that no one was permitted to report on later. Well, so be it. Maybe it was a kind of magic. The three men sat in a row on one side of the table and the three girls faced them. Bink was opposite the beautiful one. Her knees touched his, for the table was narrow. They were silky smooth, sending a shiver of appreciation up his legs. Remember Sabrina, he told himself. He was not ordinarily swayed by a pretty face, but this was an extraordinary, extraordinary face. It didn't help that she wore a tight sweater. What a figure. The judge entered. A portly man with impressive paunch and sideburns. All stand, the bailiff said. They all stood respectfully. The judge took a seat at the end of the table and the bailiff moved to the far side. They all sat down. Do you three ladies swear to tell no truth other than that presented in this hearing any time, anywhere, and to shut up about that? The bailiff demanded. We do, the girls chorused. And do you three louts swear the same? We do, Bink said with the others. If he was supposed to lie here, but never to talk about it outside, did that mean it re wasn't really a lie? The bailiff knew what was true and what was false. Presumably, so in effect. Now this is the hearing for an alleged rape, the bailiff announced. Bink, shocked tried to conceal his dismay. Were they supposed to act out, out a rape? Among these present, the bailiff continued, is the girl who says she was raped, and the man she charges, he says it happened, but it was voluntary. That's right, men. That's right, men? Bink nodded vigorously along with the others. Brother, he would rather have chopped wood for his night's lodging. Here he was, possibly lying about a rape he, he never committed. This is done anonymously to protect the reputations of those involved, the bailiff said. So's to have an a, advisory opinion in the presence of the, fir, of the first parties, without advising it to the, whole, to the whole community. Advertising it to the whole community. Bink was beginning to understand. A girl who had been raped could be ruined, though it was no fault of her own. Many men would refuse to marry her for that reason alone. 
Thus, she could win her case but lose her future. A man guilty of rape could be exiled, and a man accused of rape would be viewed with suspicion, complicating his own future. It was almost the thought... It was almost, he thought grimly, as serious a crime as having no magic. Getting at the truth could be a very delicate matter, not something either party would want to advertise in a public trial. Win or lose, reputations would suffer grievously, yet how could justice be done if it never came to trial? Thus, this private, semi-anonymous hearing thus this private semi-anonymous hearing would it suffice she says she was walking down by the gap the bailiff said glancing at his notes he came up behind her grabbed her and raped her right girls the three girls nodded each looking hurt and angry the vigorous head motioned uh, head motion caused the knee of the girl facing bank to shake and another ripple of suggestion travel traveled up his leg what an uh, what an opposite lady and what in and in what a play he says he was standing there and she came up and made a suggestion and he took her up on it right men bink nodded with the others he hoped his side won this was nervous business now the judge spoke was it close to a house about a hundred feet the bailiff said then why did she not scream? He said he'd put her off the brink if she made a, made a sound, the bailiff replied. She was frozen in terror, right, girls? They nodded, and each looked momentarily terrified. Bink wondered which of, of the three had actually been raped. Then he corrected his thought hastily. Which one had made the accusation? He hoped it wasn't the one opposite him. Were the two known to each other prior to the occasion? Yes, Your Honor. Then I presume she would have fled him at the at the out, outset, had she disliked him, and that he would not have forced her if she trusted him. In a small community like this, people get to know each other very well, and there are few actual surprises. This is not conclusive but it strongly suggests she had no strong aversion to contact with him and may have tempted him with consequence she later regret regretted i would probably were this case to come up in formal court find the man not guilty of the charge by virtue of reasonable doubt the three men relaxed bink became aware of a of a trickle of sweat on his forehead generated while he listened to the judge's potential decision okay so you have the judges if so said the the bailiff you girls still want to bring it to open trial grim-faced looking betrayed the three girls shook their heads no bink felt sorry for his opposite how could she avoid being seductive she was a creature constructed for no other vi visible purpose than re than love then take off the bailiff said remember no talking outside or we'll have a real trial for contempt of court the warning seemed superfluous the girls would hardly be talking about this one the guilty uh, the I innocent man would also shut up and bink himself just wanted to get clear of this village that left only only one man who might want to talk but if he breathed a word all the all the others would know who was who had blabbed there would be silence So it was over. Bink stood and filed out with the others. The whole thing had taken less than the promised hour, so he was was well off. He'd had a night's lodging and was well rested. 
All he needed now was to find a route past the chasm to the good magician's castle. The bailiff emerged, and Bink approached him. Could you tell me if there is any way south from here? Boy, you don't want to cross the gap, the bailiff said firmly, the little cloud forming over his head. Not unless you can fly. I'm on foot. There's a route, but the gap, dragon. You're a nice boy, young, handsome. You did a good job in the hearing. Don't risk it. Everybody thought he was so damned young. Only good, strong, personal magic would give him real manhood in the eyes of Xanth. I have to risk it, the bailiff sighed. Well, I can't tell you tell you no then, son. I'm not your father. He sucked in his paunch, which was almost as impressive as that of the judge, and contemplated the cloud over his head momentarily. The cloud seemed about to shed a tear or two. Again, Bink winced in inwardly. Now he was getting fathered as well as mothered. But it's complicated. Better have Wynn show you. Wynn? Your opposite. The one you almost raped, the bailiff smiled, making a signal with one hand and his cloud dissipated. Not that I blame you. The girl approached, apparently in answer to the signal. When, honey, show this man to the southern slope of the gap. Mind you keep clear of the dragon. Sure, she said, smiling. The smile did not add to her splendor, because that was impossible, but it tried. Bink had mixed emotions. After this hearing, suppose she accused him of... The bailiff glanced at him, understandingly. Don't worry about it, son. When don't lie, and she don't change her mind. You behave yourself, difficult as that may be, and there'll be no trouble. Embarrassed, Bink accepted the girl's company. If she could show him a quick, safe route past the chasm, he would be well ahead. They walked east, the sun beating into their faces. Is it far? Bink asked, still feeling awkward for assorted reasons. If Sabina, Sabrina could see him now. Not far, she said. Her voice was soft, somehow sending an involuntarily, in, involuntary, come on, voice, involuntary thrill through him. Maybe it was magic. He hoped so, because he didn't like to think that he could be so easily subverted by mere beauty. He didn't know this girl. They continued in silence for a while. Bink tried again. What is your talent? She looked at him blankly. Uh-oh. After the hearing, she could not be blamed for taking that the wrong way. Your magic talent, he clarified. The thing you you can do, a spell or... She shrugged noncommittally. What was with this girl? She was beautiful, but she seemed somewhat... vacuous. Do you like it here? he asked. She shrugged again. Now he was almost certain. Wynne was lovely but stupid. Too bad. She could have made some farmer a marvelous showpiece. No wonder the bailiff had not been concerned about her. She was not much use. They walked in silence again. As they rounded a bend, they almost stumbled over a rabbit, nibbling, nibbling a mushroom in the path. Startled, the creature jumped straight into the air and hung there, levitating, its pink nose quivering. Bink laughed. We won't hurt you, Magic Bunny, he said, and Wynne smiled. They passed on under it, but the episode, minor as it was, bothered Bink in retrospect, and for a familiar reason. Why should a common, garden-variety rabbit possess the magic power of floating, while Bink himself had nothing? It simply wasn't fair. Now he heard the strains of a lovely melody, seeming to punctuate his thoughts. He looked about and saw a lyrebird, lyrebird, playing the, its strings. The music carried through the forest, filling it with a pseudo joy. Ha! He felt the need to talk, so he did. When I was a kid, 
They always teased me because I had no magic, he said, not caring whether she understood. I lost foot races to others who could fly, or put walls in my way, or pass through trees, or who could pop out in one place and in at another place. He had said as much to Sherry the centaur. He was sorry to be stuck in this groove, but some unreasonable part of his mind seemed to believe that if he repeated it often enough, he would find some way to alleviate it. Or who could cast a spell on the path ahead of them, making it all downhill, while I had to cover the honest lay of the land. Remembering all those indignities, he began to feel choked up. Can I go with you? Wynne asked abruptly. Uh-oh. Maybe she figured he could regale her with more stories indefinitely. The other rigors of travel did not occur to her. In a few miles, her shapely body, obviously not constructed for brute work, would tire, and he'd have to carry her. When I'm going a long way, to see the magician Humphrey. You don't want to come along. No? Her marvelous face clouded up. Still conscious of the rape, rape hearing, and wary of any possible misunderstanding, he phrased it carefully. They were now descending a torturous path into a low section of the chasm, winding around tufts of clatterweed and clutch-root saplings. He had taken the lead, bracing with his staff so as to be able to catch her if she lost her footing and fell. When he glanced up at her, he caught distracting glimpses of her exquisite thighs. There seemed to be no part of her body that was not perfectly molded. Only her brain had been neglected. It is dangerous. Much bad magic. I go alone. Alone? She was still confused, though she was handling the path very well. Nothing wrong with her coordination. Bink found himself a bit surprised that those legs could actually be used for climbing and walking. I need help. Magic. The magician charges a year's service. You would not want to pay. The good magician was male, and Wynne had only one obvious coin. No one would be interested in her mind. She looked at him in perplexity. Then she brightened, standing upright on the path above him. You want payment? She put one hand to the front of, of her dress. No, Bink yelled, almost dislodging himself from the steep slope. He already visualized a reenactment of the hearing, and a different verdict. Who would believe he had not taken advantage of the lovely idiot? If she showed him any more of her body, no, he repeated more to himself than to her. But, she said, clouding up again. He was rescued by another distraction. They were near the bottom now, and Bink could see across the base to the more gentle rise of the south slope. No problem about climbing that. He was about to tell when she could go home when there was an uncomfortable sound, a kind of slide bump. It was repeated, very loud and shuddersome, without being precisely definable. What's that? he asked nervously. Wynne cupped her ear, listening, though the noise was plainly audible. With the shift in her balance, her feet lost purchase, and she began to slide down. He jumped to catch her and eased her to the chasm floor. What an armful she was, all softness and resist resilience and slenderness in miraculous proportions. She turned her face to him, brushing back her slightly disarrayed hair as he stood back on as he stood her back on his uh, on her feet. The gap dragon, she said. For a moment he was confused. Then he remembered that he had asked her a question. Now she was answering it with the single mindedness of the meager intellect she had. Is it dangerous? Yes. She had been too stupid to tell him before he asked, and he had not thought to ask before he heard it. Maybe if he hadn't been looking at her so much, yet what man would not have looked? 
Already he saw the monster coming from the west, a smoking reptilian head, low to the ground, but large, very large. Run, he bawled. She started to run straight ahead into the chasm. No, he yelled, sprinting after her. He caught her by one arm and spun her about. Her hair swirled uh, winsomely, a black cloud about her face. You want payment? she asked. Brother. Run that way, he cried, shoving her back toward the northern slope, since it was the closest escape. He hoped the dragon was not a good climber. She obeyed, moving fleely, fleetly over the ground, but the glaring eyes of the gap dragon followed her, orienting on the motion. The creature swerved to intercept her. Bink saw she could not reach the path in time. The monster was whomping along at galloping centaur's velocity. Bink sprinted after her again, caught her, and half hurled her back toward the south. Even in this desperate m moment, her body had a limber, appealing quality that threatened to distract his mind. That way, he cried, it's catching up. He was acting as foolishly as she, changing his mind while doomed closed in. He had to divert the monster somehow. Hey, steam snoot, he, he bawled, waving his arms wildly. Look at me, the dragon looked. So did Wen. Not you, Bink yelled at her. Get on across, get out of the gap. She ran again. No one could be so stupid as not to understand the danger here. Now the dragon's intention was on Bink. It swerved again, bearing down on him. It had a long, sinuous body and three sets of stubby legs. The legs lifted the torso and whomped it forward, causing it to slide several feet. The process looked clumsy, but the thing was traveling disconcertingly fast. Time for him to run. Bink took off down the, down the chasm toward the east. The dragon had already cut him off from the north slope, and he didn't want to lead it in the direction Wynne was going. For all its awkward m mode of propulsion, it could run faster than he. No doubt its speed was enhanced by magic. It was, after all, a magical creature. But what of his theory that no creature having magic and intelligence, if it was magic in itself? If that was valid, this thing would not be very smart. Bink hoped so. He'd rather try to outwit a dumb dragon than a smart one especially when his life depended on it. So he ran, but already he knew this course was hopeless. This was the dragon's hunting ground, the factor that stopped people from crossing the chasm on foot. He should have known that a magically constructed chasm would not be left unattended. Someone or something did not want people crossing freely from North Xanth to South Xanth, especially non-magical people like him. Bink was puffing now, out of breath, and a pain was developing in his side. He had underestimated the speed of the dragon. It was not a little faster than he, than he was, it was substantially faster. The huge head snapped forward and steam gushed around him. Bink inhaled the stuff. It wasn't as hot as he had, had feared, and it smelled faintly of burning wood, but it was still uncomfortable. He choked, gasped, tripped on a stone and fell flat. His staff flew out of his hands, that fatal moment of distraction. The dragon whomped right over him, unable to stomp so rapidly. It was so long and low that it couldn't fall. The metallic body shot past inertia, carrying the head beyond range. If magic enhanced the thing's speed, then there was no magic to help it break, for what that small blessing was worth. Bink's breath was momentarily knocked out of him by the, by the fall. He was already desperately short of air. He gasped for more. Unable to concentrate on anything else at the moment, not even on escape, while he lay effectively paralyzed, the middle set of legs came down right at him, they came together as though yoked, ready to heave the heavy body up and forward again. He couldn't even roll aside in time. He would be crushed. 
but the massive claws on the right foot landed squarely on the rock that had tripped him. It was a big rock, bigger than it looked, and he had fallen on the on the lower side after stumbling on its built-up upper side. He was sprawled in a kind of erosion gully. The three claws were splayed by the by the rock, so that one missed him to the left, another to the right, and the one, the middle one arched right over him, hardly touching the ground. Perhaps a ton of dragon weight on that one foot, none of it touching him. A lucky placement that could never have happened by design. Now he had some of his breath back, and the foot w was gone, already lifted for the next womp. Had Bink been able to roll aside, he would have been caught squarely by one of the claws and squished. But one freak break did not mean he was out of trouble. The dragon was curling around to find him again, steaming back along its own long torso. It was marvelously supple, uh, able to bend in a tight U-turn. Bink would have admired this quality more from a safe distance. Snake-like, the monster could con convolute into knots if it had to, reaching him wherever he, he tried to hide. No wonder it whomped. It had no rigged backbone, knowing it was futile. Bink still found himself trying to escape. He dashed under the tree trunk thick tail. The head followed him, the nostrils pursuing his scent as accurately as the eyes traced his motion. Bink reversed course and leaped up over the tail, scrambling for handholds on the scales. He was in luck. Some dragons had scales with serrated edges that sliced the flesh of anything that touched them. This one's scales were innocuously rounded. It was probably a survival trait in a chasm like this, though Bink wasn't sure why. Did sharp scales tend to snag on things, slowing the velocity of a low-to-ground monster? He tumbled over the tail, and the dragon's head followed smoothly. No steam now. Maybe the monster didn't want to heat up his own flesh. It was already savoring its conquest and repast. Playing cat and mouse with him, though he'd never seen a werecat do that. Possibly real cats did play that way, though there weren't many of those or mice around these days for some reason. But he was letting his mind run away with his attention again, and it he couldn't afford it. Could he lead the dragon's head such a merry chase around its own body that it actually did tie itself in a knot? He doubted it, but might have to give it a try anyway. It was better than just getting swallowed. He was back at the at the rock he had stumbled over. Now its position was changed. The moving weight of the dragon had dislodged it. There was a crack in the ground where it had been. A deep, dark hole. Bink didn't like holes in the ground. No telling what might lurk in there. Nickelpeds, sting lice, hoop worms, leper mud. Ugh! But he had no choice at all here amid the coils of the gap dragon. He jumped feet first into the hole. The earth crumbled beneath his weight, but not quite enough. He sank in up to his thighs and stuck. The dragon, seeing him uh, about to escape, blasted a torrent of steam, but again it was warm vapor, not burning hot. Actually, like more than coalescent, coalesced breath. This was not, after all, a, a fire dragon, but a pseudo-fire dragon. Few people were likely to get close enough to know the difference. The mist bathed Bink, soaking him down thoroughly, and turned the dirt around him to mud. Thus lubricated, he began to move again, down. The dragon snatched at him, but Bink popped through the, the constriction with a 
sucking sound that complemented the futile clicking of the dragon's teeth. He dropped about two feet to solid rock. His feet stung, especially the ankle that had been turned, but he was unhurt. He ducked his head down and felt about him in the darkness. He was in a cave. What luck! But he still wasn't safe. The dragon was clawing at the ground, gouging out huge chunks of dirt and rock, steaming the remainder into rivolts of mud. Gooey chunks splattered against the cave floor. The opening was widening, letting in more light. Soon it would be big enough for the dragon's head. Bink's doom had only been postponed. This was no occasion for caution. Bink strode ahead, hands touching each other before him, arms bowed in a horizontal circle. If he hit a wall, he would only bruise his forearms. Better a bruise than the crunch of dragon's teeth. He did not hit a wall. He struck a mud, st uh, mud slick instead. His foot shot out from under, and he took a belly flop. There was water here. Real water, not dragon's breath. A trickle winding down, winding down. Down? Down where? Surely to an underground river. That would account for the sudden canyon. The river could have been tunneling for centuries, and suddenly the ground above collapsed, forming the chasm, one phenomenal sinkhole. Now the river was working again, and he would surely drown if he splashed into it, for there was no guarantee that its current was slow or that there was air in its passage. Even if, the, if he swam well, he would be consumed by river monsters, the especially vicious kind that frequent, frequented dark, cold waters. Bink clawed his way back up the slope. He found a branching passage leading up, and followed it as rapidly as possible. Soon he saw a shaft of light from above. Safe. Safe. Not while the dragon still lurked. Bink dared not dig this his way out until it left. He would have to wait, hoping the predator didn't dig this far. He hunkered down, trying not to get any more mud on him. The sounds of the dragon's digging diminished, then ceased altogether. There was silence. But Bink wasn't fooled. Dragons were of the hide-and-pounce variety generally. At least the land-bound ones were. They could, they could move fast when they moved, but could not keep, keep it up long. A dragon would never successfully run down a deer, for example, even if the deer lacked escapist magic. But dragons were very good at waiting. Bink would have to stay low until he actually heard it move off. It was a long wait, complicated by the cold discomfort of the mud and dark in his prior wetting by the, by the dragon's breath, plus the fact that he could not be quite sure the dragon was there. This might all be for nothing, and the dragon could be emitting steamy chuckles as it retreated silently. They could be very quiet when they wanted to, and hunted elsewhere. No, that, well, that was what the predator wanted him to think. He dared not emerge, or even move, lest the thing hear him. That was why it was so quiet now. It was listening. Dragons had excellent senses. Perhaps that was why they were so common in the wilderness regions, and so feared. They were a survival type. Apparently, his scent had su sufficed, suffused, suffused the area, issuing from stray vents, so that it did not give away his precise location. The dragon was not about to wear itself out digging up the entire cave system, but sound or, or sight would do him in. Now that he was absolutely still, he was cold. This was summer in Xanth, and it really did not get very cold even in winter, for many plants had heat magic, local weather control, or other mechanisms for comfort. But the chasm was sparsely vegetated and sheltered from much of the sun, and the cool air tended to settle and be trapped. It had taken a while for the heat of his exertions to dissipate, 
but now he was shivering. He could not afford to shiver too violently. His legs and feet hurt, becoming cramped. To, to top it off, he felt a scratchiness in his throat. He was coming down with a cold. This present discomfort would hardly help him to throw that off. And he could not go to the village doctor for a medicinal spell. He tried to distract himself by thinking of other things, but he did not care to rehearse yet again the assorted indignities of his bitter childhood or the frustration of having but not being able to hold a lovely girl like Sabrina because of his lack of magic. The notion of lovely girls reminded him of when he would not be be human if he didn't react to her fantastic face and body but she was so abysmally stupid and anyway he was engaged already so he had no business thinking of her his efforts at self-distraction came to nothing it was better to suffer in mental silence then he became aware of something more insidious it had been in evidence for some time, but he had not been consciously aware of it because of his other concerns. Even unsuccessful distractions did some good. It was a peripheral, almost subliminal thing, a kind of flickering, which vanished when he looked directly at it, but became insistent at the fringe of his vision. What was it? Something natural or something magic? Innocent or sinister? Then he recognized it. A shade, a half-real spirit, ghost, or some uh, unquiet dead, doomed to skulk in shadow and night until its wrongs were righted or its evil exonerated. Because the shades could not go abroad by day or enter light or intrude in populous places, they represented no threat to ordinary folk in ordinary circumstances. Most were bound to the place of their demise. As Roland had advised Bink long ago, if a shade bothers you, walk away from it. They were easy to escape. This, this was called pulling the shade. Only if an unwary person foolishly slept under the abode of a shade, was he in trouble. Foolishly slept under the abode of a shade, was he in trouble. It took a shade about an hour to infiltrate a living body, and a person could move away at any time and be freed of it. Once, Roland, in a fit of uncharacteristic ire, had threatened to stun an annoying trespasser and leave him in the nearest shade barrow. The man had quickly departed. Now, Bink was neither stunned nor asleep. But if he moved, the gap dragon would pounce. If he did not if he did not move, the shade would infiltrate his body. That could be a, a fate worse than death, really. All because he had tried to rescue a beautiful vac vacuous girl from a dragon. In folklore, such a hero always received a most intriguing reward. In reality, the hero was likely as not to be to find himself in needs of rescue as now. Well, such was life justice in, in Xanth, real life justice in Xanth. The, the shade grew bolder, thinking him helpless or inattentive. It did not glow. It was merely a lesser darkness than that of the cave. He could see it fairly well now by not looking at it. A vague, mannish outline, very sad. Bink wanted to leap away, but he found the dank wall close behind him, and in any event, he could not afford to take a step. No matter how silently he did it, the dragon would hear. He could walk forward right through the shade, and all he would feel with that would be a momentary chill, like that of the grave. It had happened on occasion to him before, unpleasant but hardly critical. But this time the dragon would be on him. Maybe he could run, being fully rested and get a head start before the dragon woke. The dragon must surely be sleeping, getting its rest, while its keen ears were attuned to the quarry. The shade touched him. Bink jerked his arm away, and the dragon stirred above. 
It was there, all right. Bink froze, and the dragon lost him again. The mere jerk had not been quite enough. The dragon circled, trying to sniff him out. Its huge nose passed over the upper crack. Steam jetted down. The shade retreated in alarm. Then the dragon settled in place, giving up the chase for the moment. It knew its prey would give itself away sooner or later. When it came to waiting, the dragon was much better equipped than the human. One more reptilian twitch and the end of the tail dropped through the crack, dangling almost to the floor. In order to escape, Bink would have to brush past it. Now, what were his chances? Suddenly, Bink had an idea. The dragon was a living, if magical, animal. Why shouldn't the shade take over its body? A shade-dominated dragon would probably have other things on its mind than eating a hidden person. If he could just move over so that, so as to place the dangling tail between him and the shade, he tried, shifting his balance with tedious slowness, trying to lift one foot so as to put it forward silently. But the moment it lifted, it hurt, and he flinched. The dragon's tail twitched, and Bink had to freeze. This was extremely awkward, because his balance in this semi-squatting position was at best tenuous, and now both feet and ankles felt as if they were on fire. The shade advanced again. Bink tried to ease his foot farther forward, so as to achieve a more comfortable balance without falling over. Away from the shade. Again, agony shot through him, and again the tail twitched. Once more he froze, in even more discomfort, and yet again the shade moved in. He could not go on this way. I'm going to change over, because we've still got quite a few pages to go. i got to get more comfy. There we go. The shade touched his shoulder. This time Bink steeled himself not to flinch. He would certainly have lost his balance, and then his life. The touch was hideously cool, not cold. It made his skin crawl. What was he to do? He controlled himself with continuing effort. It would take an hour or so for the shade to take over his body. He could break the spell at any time before it was complete. The dragon would gobble him down in seconds. Appalling as the notion was, the shade was the better risk. At least it was slow. Maybe in half an hour the dragon would have gone away. Maybe the moon would fall out of the sky and squish the dragon under green cheese, too. Why wish for the impossible? If the dragon did not go, then what? Bink just didn't know. But so far, he didn't see much choice. The shade moved in, in inexorably, in, in, inexorably, in, 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 big word. The shade moved in, cooling his shoulder through to the chest and back. Bink felt the intrusion with barely suppressed loathing. How would it be possible to submit to the, this invasion of the dead? Yet he had to do it at least for a while, lest the dragon quickly converted him to a shade himself. Or would that be preferable? At least he would die a man. The ghastly cool essence, essence impinged slowly on his head. Now Bink was terrified, yet frozen. He could not lean his head away any further. The horror crept through, and he felt himself sinking, slipping, being blotted up by... And then he was eerily calm. Peace, the shade said in his mind. The peace of the pine forest, where the sleepers never woke. Bink could, could not protest aloud because of the dragon's ears, but he gathered himself for a final effort to leap away from this dread possession. He could crash past the dragon's tail before the monster could react, and take his chance with the subterranean river. No, friend, 
I can help you, the shade cried, louder but still silently. Somehow, insidiously, Bink began to believe. The spirit actually seemed sincere. Perhaps it was just in contrast to the alternatives, consumption by dragon or drowning in river. Fair exchange, the shade persisted. Permit me for one hour. I will save your life, then dissipate. My onus abated. It had the ring of, con of conviction. Bink faced death anyway. If the shade could somehow save him, it would certainly be worth an hour of possession. It was true that shades dissipated once their burden was lifted. But not all shades were honest. The criminal ones sometimes were reluctant, choosing not to atone for their crimes in life. Instead, they added to them in, in death under cover of the new identity, ruining the reputation of the unlucky person they controlled. After all, the Shade had little to lose. He was already dead. Absolution would merely consign him to oblivion or to his place in the infernal regions, depending on his faith. Small wonder some chose never to die complete, completely. My wife, my child, the shade pleaded. They go hungry. They sorrow. Ignorant to my status. I must tell them where the silver tree grows that I died to locate. The silver tree? Bink had heard of the like. A tree with leaves of pure silver, incredibly valuable. For silver was a magic metal. It tended to repel evil magic, and armor made, made from it resisted magic weapons. And, of course, it could even be used as money. No, it is for my family, the Shade cried, that they may never again dwell in poverty. Do not take it for yourself. That convinced Bink. A dishonest Shade would have promised him, any, uh, promised him everything. This one promised only life, not riches. Agreed, Bink thought, hoping he was not making a dreadful mistake. Trust unwisely given. Wait until merging is complete, the Shade said gra gratefully. I cannot help you until I become you. Bink hoped it was no deception, but what really did he have to lose? And what did the Shade have to gain by a lie? If it did not save Bink... It would only share the sensation of being eaten by the dragon. Then they would both be shades, and Bink would be an angry one. He wondered what one shade could do to another. Meanwhile, he waited. At last it was done. He was Donald, the prospector, a man whose talent was flying. We go, Donald cried through Bink's lips, exultantly. He put his arms up as if diving and rose straight up through the crack in the ceiling, which with such power that the edges of rock and dirt were flung aside. The sheer brightness of day blinded them as they emerged. The gap dragon took a moment to orient on the strange occurrence, then pounced. But Donald made another effort and shot up so swiftly that the huge teeth snapped on air. He kicked the monster on the snout hard. Ha! Gap tooth, he yelled. Chew on this, and he stomped on the tender portion of the dragon's nose. The jaws gaped open, and a cloud of steam shot out. But Donald was already zooming out of reach. The dragon had no chance to catch them before they were too high. Up, up they sailed, straight out of the canyon, above the trees and slopes. There was no effort other than mental, for this was magic flight. They leveled off, proceeding to north to across Xanth. In delayed reaction, Bink realized that he had a magic talent. By proxy, certainly, but for the first time in his life, he was experiencing what every other citizen of Xanth experienced. He was performing. Now, he knew how it felt. It felt wonderful. The sun bore down from almost straight overhead, for it was now midday. They were up amid the clouds. Bink felt discomfort in his ears, but an automatic reaction by his other self pop, by his other self popped them, making the pain 
abate before it intensified. He didn't know why flying should hurt his ears. Maybe it was because there wasn't enough to hear up here. For the first time, too, he saw the full upper contours of the clouds. From beneath, they were generally flat, but from above, they were elegantly, if randomly, sculptured. What seemed like tiny puffballs from the ground were big masses of fog in person. Donald flew through them with equanimity, but Bink didn't like the loss of vision. He was nervous about banging into something. Why so high, he inquired. I can hardly see the ground. This was an exaggeration. What he meant was that he could not make out the details he was accustomed to. Also, it would have been nice to have some some of the people see him flying. He could buzz around the North Village, astounding the scoffers, qualifying for his citizenship. No, that would not be honest. Too bad the most tempting things were not right to do. I don't want to advertise, Donald said. I could con complicate things if people thought I was alive again. Oh, perhaps so. There could be renewed expectations, m maybe debts to be paid, ones that mere silver would, would not abate. The Shades business was necessarily anonymous, at least so far as the community was concerned. See that glint? Donald inquired, pointing down between two clouds. That's the silver oak tree. It's so well hidden it can be spotted only from above, but I can tell my, b my boy exactly where to find it. Then I can rest. I wish you could tell me where to find a magic talent, Bink said wist wistfully. You don't have one. Every citizen of Xanth has magic. That's why I'm not a citizen, Bink said glumly. They both spoke enough the same mouth, through the same mouth. I'm going to the good magician. If he can't help me, I'll be exiled. I know the feeling. I spent two years exiled in that cave. What happened to you? I was flying home after discovering the silver tree, and a storm came up. I was so excited by the thought of riches that I couldn't wait. I risked the trip in high winds and got blown into the gap. The impact was so great I landed in the cave, but I was already dead. I didn't see any bones. You didn't see any hole in the ground either. The dirt filled in over me, and then my body was washed away by the river. But don't you know anything? It's the place of death that anchors the shade, not the place of the corpse. Oh, sorry. I hung on. Though I knew it was hopeless, then you came. Donald paused. Look, you've done me such a favor. I'll share the silver with you. There's enough on that tree for both my family and you. Only promise not to tell anyone else where it is. Bink was tempted, but a moment's reflection changed his mind. I need magic, not silver. Without magic, I'll be exiled from Santh, so I won't be able to share the silver. With magic, I don't care about wealth, so if you want to share it, share it with the tree. Don't take all its leaves, but just a few at a time, and some of the silver acorns that drop, so the tree can go on living in health and perhaps reproduce itself. In the long run, that will be, mo be more productive anyway. It was a fortunate day for me when you dropped into my cave, Donald said. He banked into a curve going down. Bink's ears popped again as they descended. They dropped into a forest glaive, glade, then walked half a mile to an insulated, run-down farm. It looked, it, it took that much motion to completely eliminate the lingering cramps in Bink's legs. Isn't it beautiful? Donald inquired. Bink looked at it rickety, at the rickety wooden fence and sagging roof. A few chickens scratched among the weeds, but to a man who had love invested here, love enough to sustain him two years after violent death, it must be the fairest of ranches. Um, he said, I know it isn't much, but after that cave, it is like heaven itself, Donald continued. 
My wife and boy have magic, of course, but it isn't enough. She cures feather, feather fade in chickens, and he makes little dust devils. She brings in barely enough to feed them, but she's a good wife and lovely beyond belief. Now they entered the yard. A seven-year-old boy looked up from the picture he was making in the dirt. He reminded Bing briefly of the werewolf boy he had left. Was it only six hours ago? But that impression was destroyed when the boy opened his mouth. Go away, he yelled. Better I don't tell him, Donald said slowly, a bit taken aback. Two years, that's a long time for that age. He doesn't recognize this body, but see how he see how he's grown they knocked on the door a woman answered plain in a dingy dress her hair swept back under a soiled uh, handkerchief in her heyday she might have been ordinary now hard work had made her old before her time she hasn't changed a bit donald thought admiringly then aloud sally the woman stared at him with uncomprehending hostility. Sally, don't you know me? I'm back from the dead to wrap up my affairs. Dawn? she exclaimed, her pale eyes lighting at last. Then Bink's arms enfolded her, and his lips kissed hers. He saw her through Donald's overwhelming emotion, and she was good and lovely beyond belief. Donald drew back, staring into the splendor of her love as he spoke. Mark this, darling. Thirteen miles north-northeast of the small mill pond, beside a sharp, beside a sharp east-west ridge, there is a silver tree. Go harvest it, a few leaves at a time, so as not to damage it. Mark at the metal as far away as you can, or get a friend to do it for you. Tell no one the source of your wealth. Remarry. It will make a, a fine dowry, and I want you to be happy, and the boy to have a father. Dawn, she repeated, tears of grief and joy in her eyes. I don't care about silver, now that you're back. I'm not back. I'm dead, returning only as a shade to tell you of the tree. Take it. Use it. Or my struggle has been for nothing. Promise. But, she started, then saw the look on his face. All right, Don, I promise, but I'll never love any other man. My onus is abated, my deed is done, Donald said. One more time, beloved. He bent to kiss her again, and dissipated. Bink found himself kissing another man's wife. She knew it immediately, and jerked her face away. Uh, sorry. Bink said, mortified. I have to go now. She stared at him, suddenly hard-eyed. What little joy remained in her had been wrung out by, by the brief manifestation of her husband. What do we owe you, stranger? Nothing. Donald saved my life by flying us away from the gap dragon in the chasm. The silver is all yours. I will never see you again. She softened, comprehending that he was not going to take away the silver thank you stranger then on obvious impulse you could share the silver if you wanted he told me to remarry marry her i have no magic bink said i am to be exiled it was the kindest way he could think of to decline it was the kindest way he could think of to decline Decline, decline. There it is. Not all the silver of Xanth could make this situation attractive to, to him on any level. <laughs> Will you stay for a meal? He was hungry, but not that hungry. I must be on my way. Do not tell your son about Donald. He felt it would only hurt the boy. Farewell. Farewell, she said. 
Momentarily, he saw a hint of the beauty Donald had seen in her. Then, that too was lost. Bink turned and left. On the way out of the farm, he saw a whirling dust devil coming toward him, product of the boy's minor malice toward strangers. Bink dodged it and hurried away. He was glad he had done this favor for the prospector, but also relieved that it was done. He had not properly appreciated before what poverty and death could mean to a family. And that's it for today. Um, seeing as these are getting longer, um, I may incorporate a um, intermission in between just to make it easier to film. Because um, today I was actually struggling to get through that chapter just to kind of get through it but um so next episode may have an intermission in between since we're looking at our episodes anyway uh gives us time for like bathroom breaks or whatever i know you guys can just pause the video but um it makes it easier in editing so um uh, we'll see you guys next week with chapter four mm -hmm.